Apple iPhones need location data for file sharing, VPN hijacking on Linux distros could be a thing, and new Mac malware is suspected of stealing cryptocurrency. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morse, and this is ThreatWire for December 10th, 2019. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. If you are interested in supporting ThreatWire on Patreon, hit up patreon.com slash ThreatWire. You've got one, one more day to get in on the limited edition holiday cards that I am giving away. So if you want one, you've got about 24 hours to get in on that special offer. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters, and now, on to the news. Last week, Brian Krebs of KrebsOnSecurity.com found an odd behavior on Apple's iPhone 11 Pro where the phone would try to find a user's location information even if the app on the phone had that setting turned off individually. Apple responded to Krebs saying that this functionality was by design. To disable location services entirely, you would need to navigate to settings, privacy, location services, and switch location services to off. Since this disables all location services, you also don't see a little location arrow icon at the top of the phone next to the battery icon. However, if you disable each app's location service one by one, instead of just turning all of them off at once with the location services option, that little notification arrow icon still appears from time to time. Logically, this makes it seem like there is still some kind of setting or application on the phone that is collecting location data even after all user-facing apps have it disabled separately. If the user doesn't just set all of them to off at once using that one location services option in the settings. So Krebs contacted Apple about this on November 13th and he he included a video showing the icon for location services appearing each time that he switched his phone from airplane mode to data. Users on the Apple forums were able to replicate the same issue on their iPhone 11s with iOS 13.2.3. Now, according to Apple, this is normal and is not a security issue, explaining that the icon still appears if the generic location services setting is still enabled because system services use it and they don't have a switch in the settings. A couple of days later, Apple did respond to requests for additional information. According to a spokesperson, this happens because of new short-range technology built into the iPhone 11 that lets a user share files with others nearby. Now, the tech is called ultra-wideband technology, which gives the phone spatial awareness depending on where it is in relation to other ultra-wideband devices, like other iPhone 11s. A future version of the OS will allow allow a user to disable that feature. Now, it's a low energy, short range, high bandwidth radio technology that does not interfere with other transmissions, which could be useful for file sharing via airdrop, since a user would just need to point their phone to send a file. It could also be used for image abuse, honestly. Apple explained that the icon appears whenever the device is checking to see where it's located. There are still some countries where Apple has not gotten approval to use ultra wideband since it is an industry standard technology and is subject to regulatory requirements. Now, I do think that any transmissions could open up a device to malicious threats or abuse, so allowing users to disable this completely will definitely be a good move. Unfortunately, Apple did not include a disable option from the get-go, which could have helped to minimize speculation. Once that update is released, users will be able to disable location services by default for all apps, disable ultra-wideband technology, or disable location services on an app-by-app -app basis. A team of three researchers from the Breakpointing Bad research team at the University of New Mexico found a security flaw that impacts Linux, Android, macOS, and many other Unix-based systems. The flaw would allow an attacker to sniff traffic, hijack the device, and tamper with VPN-tunneled connections. They reported the flaw as CVE 2019-14899. The problem occurs due to the way Unix operating systems deal with and reply to unexpected network packet probes within their networking stacks. An attacker could use a malicious access point or router, or they could just be on the same local network as a target. They would send unsolicited network packets to a target device and watch how those devices reply. 
They could use the vulnerability to find devices that are connected to VPNs and find out if the IP address assigned to that user from the VPN is connected and active on any given website. Now, to make the vulnerability worse, they also were able to determine the packet sequence for some VPN connections. That could allow an attacker to inject malicious data into a TCP stream to hijack those connections, even though it's on a VPN. The research team knows that it affects Ubuntu 19.10, Fedora, Debian 10.2, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, as well as several other operating systems. And while you may not use Linux at home, again, it also affects Android and Mac OS as well. Now, using one VPN technology over another did not quite seem to matter as they were able to attack against OpenVPN, WireGuard, and quite a few others. VPN providers have stated that this is a problem within the routing table code or TCP code of affected operating systems, so VPNs can't necessarily do anything about it. It's a highly technical and targeted attack, so chances are that you would not experience this yourself as it couldn't be used in mass exploitation. You must be targeted. Targeted. The researchers offered mitigation options for server owners while patches are on their way. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. My Hush Puppy Perk Level patrons are awesome for sending in their fur baby photos. I love them. Love the new one as well, so keep them coming. And if you want to support Threatwire but you don't want to be a Patreon supporter, I have opened up an online store of Threatwire swag that is limited and new products will be introduced in the future. So check out snubsy.com shop. I'll put that link down below in the show notes so you can get t-shirts, stickers, and even my own digital photography, all of which supports my shows. And as a reminder, my patrons are the reason that this show can be created each week. I know that I talk about ways that you can support this free content a lot, and that's because this show does not have a sponsor, because that would be really, really awkward if a sponsor got hacked, wouldn't it? I would rather give you a way to support this free content while getting access to over like 15 different exclusive perks. Really, I counted, like even Patreon's creator team told me that that was a lot of perks for patrons, but oh well, I like to give people things. So thank you so much to my patrons because y'all are generous human beings who enjoy the perks and you find my content valuable. And if you don't like hearing about ways that you can support Threatwire, just thank the folks around you for giving you some free content to watch, and happy holidays. Mac malware is making waves this week. Patrick Wardle, a Mac security expert with Mac software provider Jamp, analyzed new malware that is suspected to be from hackers working with the North Korean government. He found that this malware uses in-memory execution to keep it from being flagged. In-memory execution is also called fileless infection, and it does not write anything to the hard drive. It just keeps the code in memory and executes from there as well. This helps attackers evade antivirus since it's not as easily detected. This attack poses as a cryptocurrency application called UnionCryptoTrader.dmg, and two out of 57 antivirus products actually detected it, which is very, very low. By Friday of last week, detection sprang up to about 17 out of 57, still low. Now, the malware can set itself to be root or a higher privilege, as well as an executable. It creates a new directory called UnionCrypto, and it moves a hit in plist and a binary into new folders. It can also execute a binary within that directory. The actions create a malicious persistent root binary, so it will stick around after a user reboots their system. The fileless execution runs, but it's unclear what the second stage of the process does. Wardle suspects it could be used to steal cryptocurrency wallets, but why does he suspect that? Well, the techniques used match those of a hacking group from North Korea called Lazarus, who was also also interested in cryptocurrencies. It is likely that malware is being used to target folks that use the cryptocurrency exchange, and if you are worried about being infected, there's a couple of ways that you can check. You can check for a directory within library slash launch daemons called vip.uniancrypto.plist, and a running process or a binary within library slash uniancrypto called uniancryptoupdater. 
Now, before I leave, I would like to say thank you so very much to Corey, Brian, Trey, Marquise, Scott, Dante, Comey, the who knocks their head on every bloomin' door lintel, and man, mad man with a blue box. I love the Doctor Who reference, by the way. Actually, I love reading all of your screen names. Y'all are very creative, so just keep them clean so I can share them on the show. Uh, thank you all who decided to contribute to Patreon this week. You are all very awesome, and with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I am Shannon Morris, and I will see you on the internet.